But people with imposter syndrome can't accept praise. And they think everything that they do that is good is a fluke and everything they do that is bad is because they're not good enough. And so they become perfectionists, always trying to do more. And when you become a perfectionist, if you've entered a race with no finishing line ever, Eighty percent of women have imposter syndrome, and forty percent of men, and that in itself tells you something. So, imposter syndrome is really what we call feeling like a fake. I, I've got the job of my dreams, maybe the relationship of my dreams. Well, it comes up much more in a career, but I feel like a fake. I'm waiting to be found out. I'm doing this great job, but inside, I don't feel good enough. I don't feel worthy enough. I believe that. One day people are going to see that I'm a fake. And I've worked with incredibly famous film directors who say, you know, I'm just waiting for the penny to drop. And people will say, oh, he wasn't actually very good. And I was working with one many years ago who said, you know, I just feel like a fake. I'm just waiting to be found out. I said, but your last film got an Oscar. He went, I know, but there was really not any good nominations that year. And I said, but the one after that got an Oscar. I know. There were even worse nominations that year. So it's simply an inability to believe that you're good at what you do. It's an inability to believe that you have value, that you have something incredible to offer, and that you're really good. And having said that, it's actually very easy to fix it. You can do the fake it till you make it. But I think when you fake it till you make it, you still always think I'm a fake. I'm convincing everyone except the one person who needs to be convinced, which is me. So let's narrow it down. It's simply belief. I'm not good enough and I'm going to be found out. Everyone is better than me. Let me take you through some of the things on the slide. When you feel like a fraud, it doesn't matter how many people say you're amazing. Your feeling is, oh, they don't believe it or I've managed to fool them but I haven't fooled myself so praise from other people doesn't really get rid of imposter syndrome it's the waiting to be found out no matter how many awards you get how much feedback you get it's the self-doubt um, and many people who have imposter syndrome can't even accept praise when you say you're so great it's like what do you want why are you saying that you're saying that to make me feel good it doesn't work so praise for somebody with imposter syndrome is not even valid. They'll always look at, what do you want? What's your agenda? You're just saying that to get something from me. And many people with imposter syndrome overwork. They are always trying to be perfect. If I do this job perfectly, I can convince everyone that I've got a gift, I've got a talent. You know, even Elizabeth Taylor said people come to see how fat I've got, and, and actually I no longer disappoint them. Even people like Amy Winehouse couldn't believe they were really good. Even people like Whitney Houston, even Laurence Olivier, he was playing Hamlet one day, and apparently it was so incredible. He got 11 standing ovations, and people were crying in the, in the seats because he was so good. And when he finished with all his ovations, the press ran to his dressing room, and he said, don't write about that. They went, why not? He went, I don't know where it came from. And if you write about it and people come tomorrow to see me doing that, what if I can't do it? Now I'm going to disappoint them. So that was imposter syndrome. I don't know where that came from. He couldn't say it came from me. I have a gift to be a powerful actor. I can move the audience to tears. That's my gift. That's who I am. But people with imposter syndrome can't accept praise. And they think everything that they do that is good is a fluke and everything they do that is bad is because they're not good enough. And so they become perfectionists, always trying to do more. And when you become a perfectionist, if you've entered a race with no finishing line ever. So people with imposter syndrome really can't accept success. We know many, many famous people who still say, well, that was a fluke. I don't know how I did that. I would guess I was just lucky. And they feel inadequate. But we're going to show you today how to identify how you've got it, but even better than that, how to stop having it. So let's begin. Over to you, Verity. 
Great. So the next question, actually, to expand on that a little bit, how can we start to identify it? How can we recognise in ourselves if we may be suffering from it? How, how can we pay better attention to what's going on inside of us? I mean, the quickest way is to listen to your self-talk. You know, it's completely normal. I'm, I'm a speaker and it's normal to go on stage thinking, oh gosh, I hope I've remembered all of this. What if I get it wrong? It's normal to have some self-doubt. But if you want to know if you've got it, listen to your self-talk. Imagine you're recording your own thoughts and notice how much you say, well, that was a fluke. I don't know how I did that. I don't know if I can do that again. You know, and I remember when I wrote my first book, my publisher said, well, when's the next one? I went, oh no. I've only got one book in me. I couldn't possibly write another one. He said, don't be ridiculous. Of course you can. But at the time, I didn't believe that. And now I'm just writing my sixth book. So listen to your dialogue and ask your friends. Do you refuse confidence? When someone says, hey, I hear you're the best seller in your company, you go, well, no, not really. You know, there's somebody much better, but they happen to be sick at the moment. When someone says, I loved your talk, I love your product, I love your book, do you diminish it and go, oh, I don't know how I did that, and actually it's only doing well because, or well, you know, it's really easy for you to put that together, so it really doesn't have value. Actually take a, a real long, hard look at how do you accept praise. If someone says, I really love your outfit. Do you go, oh, I've had it for 10 years. I got it in a second hand. I've just got a hole in it. If someone says, I really love the way you deal with your team, do you go, well, I don't know how I did that. Because praise is a gift. And when someone gives you a gift, you have to say, thank you so much. You see, you want to expand into not being an imposter. And let's imagine you're expanding, you're moving like that. And every time you reject praise, you're contracting back. Every time you say, oh, yeah, that was nothing. Don't mention it. You're rejecting it. And something else we do when someone says, um, I love your business. You go, I love your business. Your business is great too. You're also rejecting praise because you're diminishing what they're giving you. It's like, imagine if I gave you a gift and you gave me back exactly the same gift. Hey, I've got a Joe Malone candle for you. Well, I've got one for you, so let's exchange. But now I'm back to where I was before. And it doesn't mean that you can't give people praise. But when someone praises you, let it in. Say, thank you so much. I'm so glad you love my product, my business, my ideas. I love them too. And I'm really happy that you like them and then wait at least half an hour before you say, by the way, I really love your business. Or send them an email later, but don't do that. You praise me. i got to praise you. You've said something nice. I've got to give it back. You really have to get into accepting and letting praise in to get over imposter syndrome. And you have to become an expert at praising yourself. And one of the reasons imposter syndrome has become prolific is because years ago, most of us had a boss who would pat us on that, go, hey, well done. What I saw you do today with that client was X, and it was really impressive, and I, I think you handled that really well. But now if you have a startup and you work for yourself or you're working from home, we don't get that praise. We become what I call in a praise deficit. And if you are not getting praise, that's a problem. But here's the solution, praise yourself. Imagine you're a coach working from home and your clients don't always feed back because they're so busy taking in what you say. They might go, oh my God, you're amazing, but they might not. So you have to take a minute and think, what do I need to hear on a daily basis to free me from imposter syndrome? And we can all do that right now, take a minute. What? Do you need to hear on a daily basis, even an hourly basis, that will free you from imposter syndrome? Think about what it is and then start to say it. You're amazing, you're magnetic, you're compelling, you have fantastic communication skills, you have phenomenal coping skills, you are so good with difficult customers, you're amazing at expressing yourself, you are a seller. You can sell anything. It really doesn't matter what it is, but identify what you need to hear and start to say it to yourself regularly. 
because your mind doesn't go, well, why are you saying that? That's not true. The mind doesn't know, and it doesn't care if what you tell it is right or wrong, true or false, useful or useless, helpful or not. It lets it in. In the same way, if you put lotion on dry lips, your mind doesn't go, is that organic? Is that fair trade? It, it lets lotion sink into dry skin and praise will sink in to a dry part of you. So praise yourself a lot and remember, your mind believes what you tell it, the botan. So you might as well tell it amazing things. And one of the fastest ways to get over IP, imposter syndrome, is to tell yourself the words you're waiting to. See, if you wait for your boss to go, hey, Amanda, oh my God, you are such a valuable part of this. And first of all, you think, oh, he wants me to work weekends, that there's something going on. But even if you didn't think, oh no, yeah, my boss makes me feel good. Now you've given him the power to make you feel good or her. But when you give yourself the praise you're waiting for, no one can ever take that away from you. So it's one of the fastest ways to recover from imposter syndrome forever. Amazing. Thank you for that answer. So there will be some people for whom they maybe have a deeper rooted issue, something that's perhaps from their past, a past experience or their environment growing up. How would you use RTT to help people with that, where it's a deeper rooted issue causing this imposter syndrome? Well, of course, always the best thing is to have a session with an RTT therapist, but that's not your only resource. So I want you to just think back and imagine what your parents said. You know, just imagine you can hear their voice saying, don't draw attention to yourself. Stop parading yourself around. Stop showing off. That's never going to work. One of my clients was telling me that although she's not an actress, she's a very successful academic, when she was about 11, she put on some clothes, I want to be a model, and her stepmother said, don't be ridiculous. You could never be a model. You're not tall enough. You're not pretty enough. Stop dreaming these stupid dreams because they will never work out. And sometimes we have mean parents. They go, well, that's never going to work. Don't be silly. You couldn't possibly. And other times we have well-meaning parents who say things like, well, darling, don't aim that high. You know you'll only be disappointed that's a really tough career for you to go into. When my daughter wanted to be an artist, I said to her, you know, darling, you should be an artist. You're so gifted, but you must remember you're going into a business where there's a lot of rejection. People can reject your work and love your work, and you have to really be able to deal with that. But I didn't ever say, well, you know, oh, no, artists are all starving in a garret. Nobody makes any money in that. So it's very often our parents and also teachers who say things like, well, aim low, you won't be disappointed. My daughter's teacher said to her, I think you should apply to a really low grade art school because you'll get in. Don't apply to the best one. I was so cross. I said, apply to the best one. And my daughter, I remember calling me from a station going, mommy, it was terrible. I went in, I showed them my portfolio and they said, thank you very much. And I left. And they didn't even spend any time with me. But then they called us and said, oh, we loved you immediately. We didn't need to interview. When I went to be interviewed to do a TED talk, I walked in. They said, and they said thanks very much. We'll be in touch. And I was like, wow, they don't want me. But then they called and said, oh, no, we loved you. We didn't even need to interview you. So sometimes we have these fears. But it all stems from childhood. Did you have a parent who said you can do whatever you want, reach for the stars, you'll probably get it if you work hard and you believe in yourself, you'll be amazing because 85% of your success is having a success mindset. If you had a teacher who believed in you and said, hey, you have a real gift here and you must monetize that gift and use that gift, it's your gift, you've got to share it with the world. Sadly, most of us hear the opposite. Oh, don't do that, you'll be disappointed. When I was training, um, one of my therapists in RTT, who's immensely successful, her name is Shani, she happened to take on a darts player, and she took him right to number one, and he paid her a lot of money, and her mother said, that's ridiculous. No one should be paid that amount of money. People just have to get on with it, because her mother came from an era where she didn't understand therapy, didn't understand RTT, and was actually horrified that her daughter was getting several 
thousand pounds per session. And rather than praise, I said, well, that's silly. That's ridiculous. Nobody should earn that amount of money. Sometimes we hear things like, don't brag. You know, your poor sister's not as smart as you. How do you think she feels when you show off? I've had clients who say, my own mother said, your dad is really jealous and he feels inadequate. So please play down your success. And of course, we have to remember something incredibly powerful and so true. When we are born on the planet, we must find connection. Our number one drive is find connection. Because if I'm connected, I will survive. If I connect to the people raising me, I'm going to make it. And then many children say, you know, I was really the best at tennis, the best at art. But all the other kids rejected me. I, I worked with somebody who was so good at tennis. She could be any boy. But what happened is she started to play it down because they didn't like it that she was so good. Many years ago, I was working with a very, very famous artist called Molly Parkin, who actually burned her paintings at one stage and became an alcoholic because she couldn't deal with her fame. And she said, I always remember being about six and I was at school and the teacher said, close your eyes and I want you to imagine a windy forest and the trees are swaying back so you can hear the wind. And went on with this description for a few minutes and I said, with your eyes closed, put your hand up. If you can really feel that, Molly's hand shot up. Open your eyes. She was the only kid with her hand up. And the teacher said, oh, Molly, you're a creative soul. But all the other kids laughed at her. And she said, you know, I felt terrible. I wasn't like them. And then my father would burn all my drawings. and go, what, what, what good is this going to do you? You're never going to make a living as an artist. And when she did, she's a very famous artist and a famous writer. She said, I always felt well, I don't really deserve that. And it separates me. It doesn't connect me. So we know what the tall poppy syndrome is. We've heard that expression, the nail that sticks out must be hammered down. And very often our need to belong to a group makes us say, well, I shouldn't be successful. I shouldn't have more money. I shouldn't be the smartest one because you won't like me. And that's often the beginning of imposter syndrome. If I really make it and I become famous or rich or both, I'll never know who my friends are. So there's many things that play behind imposter syndrome, but the biggest thing to understand is you acquired it. No baby is born thinking, oh, I shouldn't kick my legs and giggle and just lie here feeling amazing and beautiful because I might upset people. Babies have no concept of it. Here I am and I'm amazing. And you're going to love me, because why wouldn't you? So let's start from there. You acquired it, and you can let go of it. And we're going to do a lot of work to let go of it right now. Yes, so that brings us really nicely, actually, to the meditation we're about to do. So for anybody, if you can, get into a really quiet and comfortable space. We're about to do a 10-minute meditation with Marissa. So I'll, I'll hand over to you again, and then we'll come back to some more questions. So my meditations are called nicer, and nicer means it's new, it's innovative. You're going to impress upon yourself what you want. You're going to call in and code in your desire. You're going to erase the old stuff. You're going to repeat. So you're going to have your eyes closed. I'm going to ask you quite early on in this meditation to take these two fingers, to touch the area right in between your eyebrows and to impress upon yourself what you want to make a little indentation or a circle to impress, install, instruct how you want to be. And then I'm going to ask you to hold out your hands in this receiving position and call in what you want. And I want you to focus on what it feels like, what it sounds like, what it looks like, what it smells like. You heard the smell of success, the taste of fame. And then when you hear that little voice going, oh, that won't work. You've tried that before. Who are you to do that when really the answer is, who am I not? You I mean, imagine if Frank Sinatra was a plumber. What if, if Eminem, if Ed Sheeran was an electrician? What a waste. When you're given a gift, you're given that gift to share it with the world, whether it's inventing something, being a powerful seller 
whatever it is you're supposed to share it. So when you hear that little voice going, mm, no, you're going to just move from side to side just like that. And you're going to erase and eradicate and eliminate that voice and code in the voice that says, yes, this is what you're meant to do. This is what you're here on the planet to do. And no one can do this. Like You're going to become your own cheerleader. You're going to shut down the critic install the cheerleader, and I promise you, just being able to do that is actually life-changing. So remember, people get very confused about meditation. I've got to empty my mind. No, the human mind is not designed to be emptied or stilled or shut down. In fact, your subconscious mind is always switched on. It's always on record, and you don't have to do this perfectly. You just have to do it. Let's do it together. I promise you all it can do is help you and improve you. It can't hurt you. It can't damage you. It can just take you to a better place. So close your eyes and please keep your eyes closed, even if you don't want to. We, we start to use our subconscious mind, the controlling mind, when we're, well, our eyes are shut. Remember, you have two minds. You have a subconscious and a conscious. The subconscious is emotional. The conscious is logic, and here's a rule of your mind. Emotion will defeat logic every time. The logic of, I know I can go on stage, and I've got this speech already. I know I can pitch to a client. I know I can go for that interview because I know I've got the talent. That's the logic, but the emotion, <gasps> what if they don't like me? What if I blank? What if I blow it? What if... I don't get the job and I'm so disappointed, will defeat the logic that says I'm worthy of this and I deserve it. So you need your eyes shut to go into that emotional mind, which is going to defeat the logic. So close your eyes, keep them closed, and just practice breathing in and breathing out. Just inhale and exhale. Just simply take a breath and give a breath away. That's the first thing you did when you came onto the planet. You took a breath, you gave one away. You had that perfect balance of giving, receiving, receiving, giving. And today you're going to get really outstandingly good at receiving praise and giving praise back to yourself. So just practice receiving a breath and giving one away. And then I want you to tune into what it would be like if you couldn't receive. And so to imagine what that's like, inhale, give all that breath away, but do not take one back as weird as that feels. Just keep exhaling, keep giving that breath away, but do not receive one. And you know that you could probably do that for four minutes, but you'll probably find 30 to 40 seconds is enough before you start to think, well, this isn't comfortable. This doesn't feel good, just uh, giving and not receiving. And I want you to remember that as a metaphor for how bad it feels when you cannot receive praise. And now let's do it the other way. Now take that breath back, start receiving. But this time I want you to keep breathing in, taking a breath, taking more breath, taking even more breath and don't give. This time just receive. And as you keep Breathing in and knowing that, of course, you can hold your breath for four minutes as you keep taking more and giving less, you'll notice, too, that that, too, doesn't feel comfortable. So another moment. And now just go back to giving, receiving, receiving and giving, remembering that what you give to yourself, the praise you give to yourself is the thing that is going to dramatically, powerfully change your life. So as you continue to breathe in and to breathe out, I want you to imagine how your life would be if you didn't have imposter syndrome, if you absolutely believed in yourself, if you knew with unshakable conviction that you had a gift and your job was to share that gift, how would your life be? If you could fill yourself up with the praise you needed to hear, if you go out into the world in your chosen career and know that you're amazing and outstanding and worthy of and deserving of success, how would that feel? 
I want you to take those two fingers and just press the area in between your eyebrows. And I want you to impress upon yourself what you want. Forget about what you don't want. Let's just focus on what you want. And I want you to say out loud, as you press, I want you to repeat after me what I require of myself, what I give to myself, and what I insist on for myself is phenomenal, extraordinary self-belief. With your eyes closed, still pressing, say that again and make your voice have this kind of unshakable, unwavering conviction. What I require for myself. Repeat after me, what I give to myself. Repeat, what I insist on for myself is knowing I'm worthy, knowing I have a gift, I have a talent, and I'm here to share that with the world. I'm here to give and receive, to give of my gift and talent, and to receive wealth, praise, recognition, for my gift and talent, and still with your eyes closed, open out your hands into that receiving pose. And I want you to call in, to code into yourself what it looks like when you move through the world knowing that you are significant, that you, you matter, that you're worthy. How is your body language? How do you hold yourself? How do you walk? How do you talk? How are you when your boss says, let's do an analysis of your progress? How are you when you're meeting someone who's going to maybe do a joint venture with you? How are you when you go for an interview? Let's focus on what it looks like and what you want it to look like. Because if you can see that in your mind, you can achieve it. If you can see yourself moving through the world with confidence, with unshakable self-belief with a certainty that you matter and you've got an incredible gift. If you can see it, you can achieve it. Because if you can see it, it's in you. And now I want you to add to that, what does it feel like when you wake up going, wow, I love what I do. I do what I love. I'm really good at my job. And not only do I know that, People around me recognize that I'm gifted, that I'm talented, that I've got something to offer the world. Imagine what it feels like when you get recognition and feedback that says you're extraordinary, you're amazing. I'm so glad you work with this company. You are indispensable to this team. We value you so much. Or what would it feel like if you work for yourself and you tell yourself those same things? I'm doing a great job. What does it look like? Code that into yourself. What does it feel like? And here's a biggie. What does it sound like? And right now I want you to start saying the words, the words that you're waiting for someone else to say, the words that you're giving someone else, the power to say or not say to you. I want you to say, I'm amazing. I'm extraordinary. I'm gifted. I'm talented. I have something phenomenal and exceptional to offer the world and no one on the planet can do my job quite like me. And let's say that again, because of course the mind learns by repetition. I am amazing. I'm exceptional. I'm gifted. I'm talented. I'm extraordinary in my career. I have gifts and skills that make me stand out as amazing. And I want you to take another minute and I want you to add to that because you know better than me the words you've been waiting your entire career to hear. If you had an amazing boss who gave you incredible feedback, what would he say? Whatever it is, say it now. 
say it out loud and say it with a strong convicting voice go ahead And I want you to say it again and again. I have a gift. I have a talent. I am worthy of recognition and success. I walk through the world knowing that I matter, that I'm significant. I have something unique to offer the world. Say it again and say it again. And what will happen is, as you continue to say it, you might hear a voice going, no, everyone else is better than me. I don't really think I can pull off. When I say it, I already feel I'm lying. So I want you to just slowly move from side to side, two inches to the left, two inches to the right. And as you move from side to side, as you rock, as you sway, I want you to imagine you are erasing eradicating, eliminating, and releasing those limiting beliefs. You see, the glass ceiling only exists in your imagination. These words are not coming from your boss or your clients or your colleagues. They're coming from you. And I want you to just feel them becoming erased, eradicated. Keep swaying. And as you sway, you are erasing eradicating, eliminating, you are releasing limiting beliefs and blocking thoughts that only exist in your imagination. You see, people don't see you the way you see you. You see yourself as maybe not as exceptional as you could be, but other people don't. So again, one more time. I want you to just erase, eradicate, eliminate, shatter, end, release those limiting beliefs. Let them go. You may think, well, who told me that? Was it a teacher? Was it a parent? Was it a relative? What did they know? Did they say, don't get ideas above your station? We're not the kind of people that ever make that sort of money. These things just don't happen to people like us. Don't aim too high. You might be disappointed, whatever you're hearing that is negative, sway. And as you sway, let it go. Let those beliefs go. You were not born with them. And just feel them shrinking, fading, erasing, eradicating, eliminating. Let them go. And as you feel them going, hold your hands out again and again. Call in what you want. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it taste like, that taste of success? What does it smell like? You see, fear has a smell, but so does confidence. And what do you hear? What does it sound like? And I want you to imagine that you can hear your heartbeat. It's deep and rhythmic. Your breathing is steady. Your body language is perfect. Your energy level is that of someone who's exceptional. And your self-talk is profoundly amazing. As you say things like, I'm a success. People can only find out from me that I'm gifted. That's the only thing. You, if you looked into me, all you could see is talent say that. If you look into me, if you look over me and around me and through me, you will see talent. If you cut into me like a stick of rock, you'll see talent and self-worth at my very core. And I want you to say, I accept praise because I deserve it and I let it in. I validate myself every day with my own praise. And in doing that, it's so easy for me to be more validated by the praise of other people because I know I deserve it. I know I'm worth it. I'm good enough just the way I am. I'm phenomenal. I don't have to prove it. Of course I do great work. But I already have something amazing to offer the world. I accept success. I accept praise every day. 
I focus on the fact that I'm worthy of, deserving of, and ready for success. And let's do all of that again. I am a success. I feel like a success. And people see me and see the real me. They see somebody amazing with something incredible to offer the world. I accept praise because I'm worth it. And I praise myself every day because my self-esteem grows as I accept praise, which I do all the time. Keep repeating these words, and I'm talking not about me, but you. when I say I, I'm talking about you, not me. I feel validated. I accept success. I accept recognition. I accept praise. I feel great. I'm on this planet to be amazing, and I'm loving every minute of being amazing. And I want you to continue doing this just for one more minute or two. And as you say, I accept praise. If you hear those going, no, you don't. You know what to do. Just sway from side to side. Turn that voice into Minnie Mouse or Tweety Pie or Donald Duck. Laugh and go, yeah, watch me. So keep saying the things that will grow your self-esteem, that will nourish your soul, that will grow you as a person. And when you hear that little silly voice saying, no, I want you to turn it into Mickey Mouse and laugh at it, turn it into Donald Duck and go, yeah, why don't you just stand back and watch who I am and what I'm doing? And again, erase that limiting voice. Shut it down. You're turning that inner critic into a powerful cheerleader. And a cheerleader only knows how to bang cymbals, blow a trumpet, bang a drum, scream your name, do cartwheels and say things like, you've got this, you're amazing, go you. No one can do this better. Even on a bad day, a cheerleader cheers and goes, well, it doesn't matter, you'll be amazing tomorrow. So I want you to know that you have the power every day, every hour to shut down your inner critic, like turning down a radio, but turning on your cheerleader who cheers and believes in you and says the words you've been waiting to hear for years and don't wait another moment. Say them, repeat them, state them, affirm them, validate who you are. And very quickly, you'll find that that whole IP is something you used to have once upon a lifetime ago. It is shrinking, fading, disappearing. It's leaving you. So take another moment. And remember, even though we're just spending a little while on this, this technique isn't going to self-implode. You can do this any time at all on the commute to work, when you're in the bar just before you go to sleep, just after you wake up, at any time, just before an important meeting, you can impress upon yourself what you require and insist on for you. You can code in and call in what it looks like, sounds like, feels like, and you can erase and eradicate anything that would get in your way, including your own limiting beliefs, and you can repeat and rewire and be a cheerleader instead of a critic because criticism withers and praise and cheering grows. And you're growing as a person right now. And you're going to continue growing. So when you're ready, just open up your eyes and just come back into the room and take a moment. Thank you. That was really amazing and some amazing tips. Thank you. The physicalizing it and changing the voice was amazing. That's an amazing technique for people to hang on to. Um, I'm going to go back to questions now. So we've got people that have written in. And the first one here, this is from Debbie, and she writes, I want to be a therapist, but how do I overcome this thought that I need extensive academic studies before I can help someone through trauma? Who am I to support someone through that? Well, who are you not? That's what I would say. Who are you not? You know, if ever any of us have been in AA, one of the prerequisites to be an AA counsellor is that you have to have been having a problem with alcohol because 
if you've been there, you have empathy. You can say, I understand. I know exactly what you're talking about. I, too, sold my kids' toys to buy alcohol, and I, too, felt that terrible sense of shame. And when you have someone like that, you feel a sense of bonding. So the thing that makes a phenomenal therapist is empathy, really wanting to make a difference. And we've trained 10,000 therapists all over. I can tell you without skipping a beat, because I travel the world with, we, we cherry pick the very best therapists and they become our trainers. And we go to Australia and New York and Miami. And recently I was saying to someone, isn't it amazing that our best trainers only two of them are assisting therapists the others one was a city worker one was a personal trainer one worked in a company as an accountant and so we found that actually our best therapists don't have a background in psychology they don't have a background in human behavior but our training is so extensive that we teach that but some of the very best therapists on the planet don't come from that background of being a psychiatrist, doing 10 years or five years studying human behavior and psychology, they have that calling to make a difference, that passion to help. And I think the thing that makes the therapist amazing is people skills. I love people. I love hearing their story. I love working out what makes them tick and knowing that I have the power to help them tick way better. And it doesn't mean that a therapist can't be great who's been to college and spent five years studying human behavior. But a lot of that you can narrow down. And when we train you, we train you in the basis of human behavior straight away. The rules of your mind, the three ways your mind works, the three things wrong with you, the four ways we behave in order to belong. And some of the best therapists in the world, I'm thinking about Wayne Dyer, Tony Robbins, Louise Hay had no therapy background whatsoever, but were extraordinary people at changing human behavior. And if they could do it, you could do it too. If that's what you want, do it. And the very fact that you want it so much means it's a calling and you'll be amazing. But don't let that lack of psychology background hold you back because sometimes that can actually be a handicap. I know that because I train so many doctors who say, you know, when people come in, with a migraine or a nervous stomach, we're trained to look for what's wrong with the body, whereas we really should be looking at what's wrong with the mind. Most of us don't have broken bodies. We have broken thinking. We have broken experiences. And if you look at what is an autoimmune disease where the body attacks itself, which is incredibly common now, that's because something's gone wrong with your thinking. I've met many doctors who say 70% of clients going to ER or A&E, depending on which country you're in, come in with real physical issues, real headaches, real skin conditions, real stomach problems, real uh, nervous conditions, but they're not caused by an organ that's gone wrong. They're caused by a thinking that's gone wrong, and we're really not equipped to deal with that. But someone like you is, and with the right training, you will be amazing. Next question, please. Moving to the next question. This is from Stephanie who asks, when your job demands perfection, so being a lawyer uh, or a doctor or a medical professional, how do you get over imposter syndrome? You see, I don't think any job does require perfection. I think often, I mean, one of my favorite films was Rainmaker, where Matt Damon was this incredible lawyer. And if you haven't seen it, see it with Claire Danes. And he was a rookie. And it was actually his inability to be perfect that made him win the case. I met someone who was a phenomenal salesperson. Said, so, you know, the first time I sold, I was so nervous. I said to the customer, I'm really nervous. Do you mind if I read this? He said, it was so effective. I've been doing it for 10 years. And it's not being perfect. A lot of lawyers and doctors aren't perfect. And when they try to say, I'm never wrong, I don't know. A doctor will often say, I'm going to send you for a second opinion because I'm not sure here. A good lawyer will say, I'm going to do my very best. But many doctors and lawyers actually under promise. I'm, I don't know if we're going to win this case because when they over promise, oh, we're going to win, it's going to be amazing. And then you come back, well, we didn't win. You lied to me. Now I have to sue you because you overpromise. So most doctors and lawyers are very hesitant to overpromise. I'm going to cure your cancer and you're going to be fine. They say, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try really hard. But they won't overpromise because they know they're not perfect. In any profession where you believe I've got to be perfect, don't do that. Some of the best lawyers in court 
aren't perfect. They show their vulnerability. They show their real side. And so I think that belief hurts you. And I would give that belief up as fast as you can. You know, I love my job. I know I'm good at it, but I'm not perfect. I make mistakes many times, but I've learned from those mistakes. But I don't think there is a profession where you could ever be perfect. And I think if you have to be seen to be perfect, I think that hurts you. So I go back and look at your career and look at some amazing lawyers and look at the ones who thought they were perfect and lost a case, but the others who weren't sure they were perfect and won a case. And I would say, give that belief up. Be as good as you can most of the time, but please don't try to be perfect in your chosen career because it's a race that you can't win because you can't even complete it. So the next question, this is from Rajiv who asks, can the wounded child be a root cause for imposter syndrome? So that might need some explanation a little bit around what that means, wounded inner child. Well, here's the thing about the wounded inner child. You know, a baby comes onto the planet, <clears throat> they believe they're worthy in the womb and all their needs are met. When you're in the womb, <clears throat> it's rather like being in Hawaii. It's always 75 degrees, you have 24 hour room service. No baby thinks I'm not worthy, I don't deserve attention, I shouldn't cry because my mum's exhausted. But then what happens is as children we have very simple needs. I mean they're so simple, I could reel them off the top of my head right now. A newborn baby's need is to feel significant, to feel connected, to feel worthy of your love because they know one thing innately, if you care about me, I'm going to survive on the planet because you'll take care of me. And that little baby becomes a toddler who has very similar needs. I need to feel significant. I need to feel I matter. I need to feel celebrated. I need to feel worthy. I need to feel connected. And as we get older, there's another need that comes in, which is I need you to be proud of me. The problem is that when those needs are not met and so often they're not going to say, oh, I wish I'd never had you. You're so expensive. You cost me so much money. You were the fourth girl and I really wanted a boy and I cried when you were born because I was so disappointed. Not all parents say that, but often they do. The child starts to realize their needs. and My parents don't celebrate my birthday. My parents don't turn up to school to pick up. They never come to prize day or sports day. They don't tune in to what I need. Now the, the child has a belief, no one's ever going to meet these needs. And they go through the world with two beliefs. I can't get these needs met or I've got to find someone to meet my needs. But then if they leave me, I'm back to having these unmet needs. And when a child's needs are not met, they never stop loving the parent or the carer. They immediately stop loving themselves. And so inner child work is quite profound. And it's practiced by so many different cultures and religions because it takes you back and it shows you that child with unmet needs and it shows you how to meet those needs. I never had a birthday, well, I can celebrate that. I never got praise. I can give myself praise. I wasn't loved, well, I can start today loving myself. Nobody had time for me. Well, I'm going to change that. So the inner child work is going back and seeing what's happened to that child and reclaiming them and putting them back together again. And it's immensely powerful. People often say to me, wow, who would have thought that 10 minutes was so profound? I suddenly understood everything. In fact, somebody wrote to me and said, you know, I just read your book and I listened to you on YouTube. And then I went back and took a look at my inner child and realized I blamed myself for everything, even my sister burning her hands because when I was two or three, my mother went out to hang out laundry, left me and my baby sister, left me in charge of the baby sister who put her hands on the oven and burnt them. And for the rest of my life, I've been to look at your sister, you did that. But I didn't do it, they did it. They left me in charge of a baby when I was three and I could never say that before. And so the inner child work allows to say, hey, I, I deserved love and affection and attention. I didn't get it, but I'm going to give it to myself now. And it's incredibly powerful. And part of its power is its strength and its simplicity because no child is born with imposter syndrome ever. In fact, if you think about this, I used to drive my little girl to school with her friends in the car and they'd play X They'd go, hey, sing a song, I'm Simon Cowell. No, yes, 
and they'd all sing and I'd ask them to sing and they'd sing me songs and they just found that the most normal thing. Imagine if I was taking 14, I was like, hey, could someone sing? They're oh God, you're so embarrassing. I'm not going to sing. A little kid will dance, sing, perform because they have no concept that you could reject them. That kid as a teenager will hold back from many, many things. I mean, you only have to go to a park or a pool and hear children go, mommy, look at me swing, look at me in the pool, watch me jump, watch me dive, watch me swim, watch me come down the slide, because they have no concept. They go, you're not very good. Oh, you could have done a much better dive than that. They're saying, watch me celebrate who I am and look at all the things I can do. But you simply won't find that with a group of 14 year olds who've already started to think, oh, don't watch me. I might get it wrong. Don't look at me because I'm probably not good enough. So we know we're not born with it. And that's great news because if we're not born with it, we can let it go because we only ever acquired it. And I really hope that helps you. Next question, please. Thank you for that. I just want to read out a really lovely comment we've had, actually, someone's testimonial. This is Maria Kelly, and she says, I attended the live training with this wonderful lady and her team in the shadow of my imposter syndrome. I've totally overcome the negative self-talk and feelings by making my own recording and listening to it every day. Imposter syndrome is the one biggest thing that kept me small. So that's amazing to hear you've overcome that. Thank you for telling us and sharing it. Um, one quick question, Marissa. Somebody's asked... Is imposter syndrome linked to procrastination? Um, yes, it absolutely can be. See, if you feel not good enough, then your fear is going to be one day I'll be find out, found out. And many people who fear not being good enough either self-sabotage or procrastinate because then they can say, well, you know, I could have. I could have written a great book. I could have started my own business. I could have done this, created this product. But you see... I, I was a massive procrastinator. I just couldn't get off the couch or I, I had this self-sabotage. I don't know what really what was going on. What is going on is I'm so scared of failing and, and inventing a product, opening a business saying, oh, it failed. It's actually less painful to say, well, it was the imposter syndrome. And so our fear of failing is profound. Our fear of rejection is profound. And that isn't always why you have procrastination, but it's very, very common. It's what I call the unspeakable truth. I've created one problem. I procrastinate. I self-sabotage. I eat cookies and I should be working. I stay up all night watching Netflix. And I've got a really important meeting the next day. I don't know why I'm doing that. You're doing it to stop yourself getting to the unspeakable truth. I'm just not good enough. I've done the work and I failed. And it's easier to blame a habit. Oh, it was the drinking. It was the insomnia. But when you know that you're worth it, you don't have those habits. They go, go hey, no, I am worth it. I'm going to write this book, make this product, grow this business because I'm worth it. And so it's very important to understand that all of these little Things that are going to, or big things that get in the way are just trying to move you away from your fear of not being good enough. But when you decide to remind yourself that you are good enough, all of those habits that you don't need will just go away. Check out my next video here.